I've known Guido Ruggiero for more than 40 years. 40 years, Guido, I know, 40 years. Dating back to when we were both at the University of Connecticut, uh, he set the standards even back then. Of course, he is brilliant, but so is everybody else in this room is brilliant. The, the, the difference is for him, it was the, it's the work ethic. Uh, he was always in an extraordinary work ethic. Uh, I can attest to that. He starts working before the sun comes up. I was determined to outwork him back at UConn uh, and left the house. So we lived in Hartford, Diane can tell you. Took me about 30 minutes to drive there. Some mornings I would get up at 7.30 uh, to beat him into the office. And when I arrived on campus, there he would be already at work. Uh, but I would catch him on the other end uh, because uh, I'm a late night person. So typically uh, left the office much later than he did. Only Mary Lindemann has known him longer than uh, me. She has known him, I think, since birth. Uh, he is indeed a, a well-known, world-renowned scholar of the Italian Renaissance uh, and every component of the Renaissance, which includes, thanks to his work, we now add to our understanding and analysis everyday culture uh, and uh, e even sex uh, and love. He has received all the accolades you can receive from a Regents Fellowship to National Endowment for the Humanities to a Guggenheim, appointment to the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton, to Villa Aitati in Italy, a Cooper Fellow at the University, et cetera, et cetera. Appointments and service on numerous editorial boards. His publication list is uh, too massive to try to list here. I am nevertheless uh, going to mention what I consider his most important book contributions. Yes, he has published in the American Historical Review, et cetera, but let me focus on books. Most of his book publications have been with Oxford University Press, John Hopkins University Press, and most recently also at Cambridge University Press and Harvard University Press. Uh, Violence and Early Renaissance, uh, Venice, 1980. The Boundaries of Eros, Sex, Crime, and Sexuality in Renaissance Venice, 1985. Sex and Gender in Historical Perspective, 1990. And with Ed Muir, several volumes, including Sex and Gender and Microhistory and the Lost People of Europe, 1990 and 1991, respectively. Binding Passions, Tales of Magic, uh, marriage uh, and power from the end of the Renaissance, 1993. That's one of my favorites. Uh, still uh, with Laura, he did one. Uh, the, the translated and edited uh, five comedies uh, from the Italian Renaissance that came out in 2003. Machiavelli in Love, Sex, Self, and Society in the Italian Renaissance, 2007. I remember that this one came out while Mary Lindemann was chair uh, and she gave a book party at her house. Remember that at her home. Uh, and when she and her husband, Michael, uh, told me that uh, Guido had specifically said that no one is to mention his book, I took that as a red flag. Give me the book. I immediately took the, the forefront and, and you know, you don't tell somebody from the 60s not to do something. You, 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 you don't want them to do, if you want them to do something, you, you, you tell them something to the opposite. Uh, with that in mind, I eagerly volunteered to speak uh, to the group uh, about his book, uh, anything to anger Guido, uh, Guido uh, but the book deserves uh, accolades uh, so those, uh, as those gathered uh, there uh, concurred. Love and Sex in the Time of Plague. A Decameron Renaissance 2021. I just finished reading the book, uh, this one, a, a couple of weeks ago. Hence, I can say honestly that I've read all the books I just listed to you. Uh, but then again, I have had 40 years to do this. <laughs> Enough said. Uh, let's hear from the author, Guido Ruggiero. Well, let me begin by thanking Don for that kind 
and surprisingly kind introduction because knowing Don for so long, I know that he's not usually quite so complimentary. And unfortunately he has a lot of stories he could have told and I'm glad he didn't because I was ready to have my counter stories from 40 years, a fantastic friendship. Don really has been uh, everything a friend should be over a long period of time and, th and that's rare. And also a model of what I think scholars should be in that He's not only a great intellectual and a great teacher and a great writer, he's also deeply committed uh, to his scholarship, uh, like one would wish we all could be. Uh, so he's been, for over all these years, a model, aside from his work habits, I must say, uh, because he tends to come in with banker's hours rather than uh, when you should. Uh, and there's some good stories I could tell about that, but I won't because he was kind enough not to tell his good stories about me. Um, I'd like to also thank Hugh and the Humanities Center for setting this up, putting it up with uh, a difficult transition from books and books to this venue. And uh, I think it's working quite well, even though there are some technical problems, but there are always technical problems. Uh, I'd like to also thank those of you who come out this evening uh, for being here and for those of you who are listening in uh, on uh, Zoom. Uh, okay, so let me begin. Um, 1348 was a year that shocked the Western world for an apparently new plague that would become known as the Black Death struck Europe carrying off perhaps as much as two thirds of the population. Indeed, it is still remembered as one of the greatest disasters of history, dwarfing our contemporary COVID pandemic. At the time, however, it seemed especially alarming as it appeared to confirm widely shared fears that the end of time was nigh. For the frightening mortality had left survivors wandering in the suddenly empty streets of once thriving cities and those in the countryside contemplating abandoned fields and villages with dread about what few, few further disasters a cruel punishing God had in store for them. In response, Giovanni Boccaccio claimed to have written the Decamera, one of the most important and read works of pre-modern literature. Although he had begun collecting and rewriting the 100 tales that comprise the heart of that work before the plague and continued revising it afterwards, he declared that he had decided to write the book to help his fellow Florentines weather the emotional stress of that staggering loss and devastation. His tales, he promised, would provide a pleasant diversion from the painful reality of those empty streets and vacant palaces of their once flourishing city. And significantly, one of the themes of those stories that he asserted would be most useful for accomplishing this was love, a crucial emotion he claimed that was key to returning life to normal. But for Boccaccio and the tales he collected and rewrote, where there was love, sexual desire and sexual intercourse were normal and expected fellow travelers. Moreover, he promised that love together with sex would offer something more valuable yet. For together, he suggested, they evoked emotions that were central for lifting the spirits of survivors, especially the spirits of the women who had suffered so much, both from the plague's devastation and from the unjustly restrictive traditional ways of life of their society. In sum, the healing powers of love and sex, Boccaccio declared, was the motive for writing the Decameron and a key for rebuilding a new normal. The Decameron then, much like a great symphony, a human symphony of the Italian Renaissance, sings of the hopes that Boccaccio placed in love and sex to overcome the dark days of his present and the looming apocalyptical prospects of a future 
apparently in the hands of a wrathful and punishing God. And what is particularly telling for this study and Boccaccio's contemporaries was how they could hear it, hear its many promising melodies on love and sex, now laughing, now tragic, at times bass, at times refined, occasionally whimsical and frequently realistic. In turn, in considering how the presentation of love and sex in these tales was received and imagined in their historical context, this book weds the interest of the critic in reopening the excitement of a great classic and of the historian in rediscovering the historical texture of rich tales to offer engaging and enlightening reading, both for scholars and a more general public. For the Decameron with its 100 tales told over 10 days by Boccaccio's fictional group of young aristocratic Florentines speaks to the life of a city, Florence, that was becoming culturally and economically one of the most important in the West. Thus it was read there and elsewhere in the urban world of Northern Italy with a shock of recognition that the life of which it spoke had not only changed profoundly, but was continuing to change rapidly in the aftermath of the plague. Merchants, bankers, lawyers, intellectuals, and even the artisans there had come to matter. The popolo, which I have on your handout or screen sheet here, literally the people as they styled themselves. In turn, the old nobility and their ways no longer were the stuff of, of tales that mattered in Florence, except as lessons on an outdated past or misguided present, lessons to which the Decameron returned regularly. Can we treat the Decameron then as both a cr crucial literary work and a source of social and cultural history? Actually, long ago in an article published in the early 90s, I proposed just this more generally, argu arguing that historians might profitably return to the imaginative world of literature to read it as not, as, not merely as exemplary or background material to more serious history, but rather as crucial documentation of the largely lost imaginative worlds so crucial for understanding the quotidian life of the past and its history. In turn, I suggested that the well-established tradition of using historical sources to add depth and nuance to literary criticism, itself undergoing a theoretical renaissance at the time, could also benefit from the more sophisticated archival-based history that had flourished after the Second World War. Essentially, I hypothesized that we had two text-based disciplines, history and literary criticism, that could learn a great deal from each other if scholars broke across disciplinary boundaries in dealing with their texts, adopting the strongest strategies and theoretical discoveries of each to open exciting new vistas on literature and the past. That was what I have attempted to do in my books and articles over the last two decades here at UM. In this new book then, I reread a great text focusing on love and sex and melding the insights of literary reception theory with history to imagine how the symphony of life that is the Decameron was heard at the time of the play and what that says about the shared culture of its day. Obviously a controversial approach, hopefully it will open new debates and perhaps reopen old ones, both historical and literary. And significantly, we have a great deal of information on the history of the period in Florence and its cultural world, along with that of city, the cities of Northern Italy to add depth and nuance to that rethinking. In turn, unlike most traditional literary studies, this book is less concerned with the literary antecedents of the Decameron, extensively and exhaustively studied by others. 
which allows it to focus on how its tales were heard, read, and imagined in its day, and make them come alive again, often in a new light for modern readers. Essentially then, it is a study of the shared culture of love and sex in the Italian Renaissance from the perspective of the Decameron, and the Decameron itself from that perspective. Of course, fine tuning is necessary as one needs to judge how a text and its themes might play when they clashed at times with aspects of culture that were not widely shared or with how some readers might respond to controversial portrayals of their culture and values. Thus, for example, while arranged marriage rather than marriages for love or sexual desire might be accepted as the ideal norm in the shared culture of the day at virtually all social levels. Exceptions are, in fact, a topic which the Decameron returns to repeatedly. Or while adultery was generally frowned upon and officially a crime in the shared culture of the day, striking a troubling note for husbands, patriarchs, and women as well, often both the literary tradition and the Decameron portrayed such illicit desires as the epitome of uplifting passion when true love was involved. Yet it is exactly in dealing with such lacks of a neat fit between the shared culture of the day and what a text like the Decameron has to say that we find the most revealing historical and literary discoveries. And tellingly, often in such complex variations on common themes, revealing and, ex and exciting new old ways of hearing and rereading the camera can be discovered, making it a foundational text for the history of sex, love, and gender, even as it remains a highly entertaining literary classic. This book then begins with an introduction designed to put a more general reader interested in the camera on an equal fit footing with a more scholarly one and to provide scholars with a brief explanation of the book's rather different approach to the discursive nature of the shared culture of the day. For this, I draw extensively upon the new insights of my 2015 massive study of the Italian Renaissance, the Renaissance in Italy, a social and cultural history of the Rinascimento, published by Cambridge. In a way, this new, much smaller book might be considered a micro study from the perspective of love and sex of the big themes and new ideas introduced in that earlier 600 page tome. More importantly, however, it briefly describes how this book builds upon a series of reconsiderations of a number of the most interesting and controversial tales of the camera and how they interrelate from the perspective of love and sex and the emotions that were associated with them. Love and sexual desire, it proposes, were imagined as closely intertwined groups of feelings, often quite different from the modern. At once dangerous and disruptive, these feelings were often seen as emotions with a decidedly negative valence. Yet at the same time, they could also be portrayed as positive forces that bound individuals and society together, offering pleasure and meaning to life. Each chapter then considers a different aspect of love and sex, and in particular, how they were portrayed and imagined in the Decamera and shared in the culture of the day. The first chapter, Laughter, begins by inviting us all to imagine how love and lust were felt at the time by asking us to imagine ourselves as a character in one of the tales who falls in love with a young woman, we assume to be the wife of the owner of the villa where we are painting frescoes. Imagining with the text our emotional turmoil and the thoughts of adulterous love and desire that accompany it, we are given a historical tour of the familiar as well as the decidedly unfamiliar range of feelings that we experience in our more than slightly mad passion. 
culminating in an apparently happy ending, which turns suddenly sour with the arrival of our irate wife, just as we believe we are about to finally enjoy true love's highest pleasures. The violent beating that follows and the startling reversal of love lost opens a deeper discussion of how love and sexual desire worked, the violence they could entail, the social issues that were so crucial in co coloring them for contemporaries, and how the distinction between love and lust involve critical social evaluations quite different from the modern. And while that is the focus of the discussion, illustrated further by other tales from the Decameron and archival documents from the period, the chapter also opens many of the themes that will follow and return for deeper consideration and perhaps leaves us all slightly humbled and curious about the strong feelings associated with love and sex in the time of the plague, and relatively beaten as well. The second chapter, Violence, takes off from the violence that ended the first to look more closely at how easily love and sexual desire morphed into violent emotions and deeds, and thus the depth, depth of the dangers they threatened. Using several stories that are often interpreted as misogynistic, and advocating violence to control women, a more controversial reading is suggested based on an analysis of the way violence was viewed at the time in archival documents and the way in which violence and love were understood to have positive associations in particular situations. In some, how the tales were read and imagined quite differently and troublingly in late 14th century. Florence. Chapter three, Tears, takes the violence of love and sex associated with honor to its all too often tragic conclusion, death. Looking more closely at the tales told on the fourth day of stories dedicated to the tragic, it considers the intimate relationship between love, sex, and honor with darker emotions such as rage, vengeance, and despair and ultimately with murder and death. Although this may seem to evoke Freud's modern association of love, sexual desire, and death, the actual focus is on the reality of death and mourning after the plague and the dangers of unmitigated, unmitigated grieving over lost loved ones. Such a focus on the danger of mourning takes on even deeper meaning when it is recalled that the, the camera is explicitly presented as an antidote to the plague's devastation, especially for women suddenly alone, brooding on their losses. Moving from death and, and the mourning associated with love to love's deepest promises of peace, happiness, and ultimately spiritual bliss, the fourth chapter, Transcendence, focuses on one of the most sexually and apparently blasphemous stories of the Decameron, the famed tale of Alebek and Rustico. Alebek is a young pagan girl deeply impressed by the reports about what a wonderful religion Christianity is. Thus, she journeys to the nearby desert to learn from the desert hermits the pleasure of their faith. After a number of hermits refused to instruct her, fearful of her youthful beauty, a young hermit, Rustico, overestimating his own ability to reset, resist temptation, takes her in. Literally, it will, be, it will turn out. In fact, temptation wins out quickly, and Rustico misrepresents what Christianity requires, claiming that the essence of Christian worship turns on putting the devil back in hell, where God had attempted to confine Lucifer and evil after his betrayal. He then explains to Alabek, in quite graphic terms, which I'll spare you for the moment, that putting the devil back in hell is actually the supreme and final goal of God and Christianity. Outrageous and apparently blasphemous, the sexual relationship that follows 
is usually dismissed as just that. But again, considering how the tale would have been heard in the context of the spiritual enthusiasms and religious turmoil of its day, enhanced by the fears engendered by the plague, allows the analysis to go deeper into the issues involved and progressively make a series of more suggestive claims about what love and sex might actually have been seen as implying at the deepest spiritual and theological levels for at least some of those hearing the Decameron. Although admittedly the chapter pushes those theological reveries to and perhaps beyond the limit, well hidden in the notes, the attentive reader will find some tempting support for even its most radical and revolutionary suggestions. The final chapter, Power, focuses on one of the most troubling tales of the camera, the last. It is often read today as a misogynist tale of the poor peasant girl, Griselda, who the Marquis of Saluzzo, Gualtieri, marries and subjects to a series of cruel tests, as well as an ongoing series of demeaning insults. All justified in the end, by his claim that such treatment reveals the way a wife should be selected, trained, and disciplined by a husband in order to make an ideal marriage. Once again, by considering the way the tale would have played with Florentine readers at the time and using love as a key to its reading, this chapter turns that traditional interpretation on its head. Gualtieri is presented as a signore, and you see the term here at the kind of end of the list, a term that for contemporary Florentines was used interchangeably for a husband, a noble, nobleman, a prince, and even God. As such, because he rejects love for Griselda in his marriage, Gualtieri is portrayed as not only an example of the worst kind of husband, but as an unloving prince who similarly mistreats his subjects. Indeed, he may also serve as an example of the many evils of Florence's neighboring tyrants, signori again, that Republican Florentines not only loathed, but were almost constantly at war with at the time. And in his total lack of love for anyone but himself, he might even be seen as the ultimate signore, God, who in his cruel punishing plague seemed to have forgotten Christ's promise love for humanity. Thus read from the perspective of the way the tale would have been heard in his day in Florence, it becomes not a defense of a sternly patriarchal vision of marriage, but rather an attack on love, unloving husbands who not only create the unhappy marital situations that lead many Decameron women to cuckold their husbands with the sympathy of its readers, but also an attack on the unloving and threatening tyrants who surround Florence, and perhaps in a theological sense, even the unloving God of the plague. And more directly, the last tale of the Decameron could be heard as a pian to the importance of love in marriage. For the happy ending of the tale turns on the Marquis confessing that he has finally fallen in love with Griselda after all her suffering, and she accepting with love his transformation from a cruel husband into a loving one. This, it is argued, is a fitting end for the Decameron, for one of its most original features at the time was its seemingly modern emphasis on true love as a basis for happy marriages against the tradition of arranged marriages maligned in tale after tale. This rereading ends the book, pulling together all it seems and recovering a significantly different vision of how the Decameron symphony of life, love and sex would have been heard in its day. In turn, it recovers the masterpiece as a historical text that illuminates a very different period liberating it from misunderstandings as medieval, a term which may apply to the rest of Europe, but is definitely misleading for the new urban world of Italy in the 14th century, with apologies to you, 
and reestablishing it as, a, as foundational for the Italian Renaissance and in a way for the Western tradition of love and sex. Thus, hopefully it makes a perfect ending for a book designed to reopen the Decameron, its tales of love and sex and the feelings and passions associated with both. Love and sex, when they were still imagined as conjuries of feelings or emotions, dangerous, dark, violent, yet full of light and promise, and crucially rich with the melodies of life itself. In a way then, switching metaphors, this book aims to strip away the centuries of creative, but often misleading Decameron readings, true to their own day perhaps, but not to its, that have clouded its bright, lively, laughing, and tearful notes to literally rediscover it and make it come alive again with the emotions, feelings, and dreams of its historical moment, love and sex in a time of play. Thanks.